Next up on the Cosmic News Network, First Contact with Joshua Putt. How you doing today? Welcome back to First Contact Radio. Today is Tuesday, the 24th of May, 2016. Sun sign and Gemini moon sign made the transition from Sagittarius into Capricorn, where it is right now. Capricorn's an earth sign. Our sun sign, Gemini, is an air sign. So we're dealing with the two elements of air, Gemini and earth. Capricorn. If you notice here, we've got two that are very similar, right? We've got the two characters, male and female, chained to the box of ignorance. You've got this character which is presiding over this, and as long as these two think that this is what's there, they're trapped in ignorance, unaware of what's going on. However, you notice the picture here, it's the same same thing, right? The only difference is here. They're looking to this character, which is devilish character, as we know the representation of. But here they're looking towards the higher self, the angel. So there's some synchronicity here, some similarity that we need to pay attention what it is that we're looking towards. Okay, we have the higher self that's out there that's guiding us. But we also have these other forces around us that seem to be competing against that wanting to throw us off on what it is we believe, what we don't believe, and so on. The Hebrew letter assigned to the card of Capricorn, the devil card, is Ayin, which means I, which means we need to look past the illusion of things. It also means we can't take the physical for exactly what it, the face value of it. There's something more behind it because that's what this represents. It represents when you see only the physical and you forget about the spiritual. Then you get caught up thinking this is all. You're chained to the block of ignorance. And that's what's going on. It relates to the story of Yaldabaoth, who was ignorant. And then once he understood about his ignorance, instead of learning from it, he became arrogant. Because he did not want to know that there was somebody else above him. Over time, things may have changed. Maybe he evolved. Maybe he grew into a different phase of learning. But nonetheless, that is what that represents when we get into a state of ignorance. We're unaware of what's going on around us because we're too caught up in one particular way. And that may not be the way. So, we have uh, 4.44 a.m. Our imagination, Venus and uh, Gemini got together. So that's bringing some love and creativity in the way that we communicate some imagination into it. 9.38 a.m., we have an opposition between Venus and Mars. So our imagination is, take a look at the Venus and the Mars. Here's the Mars right here on the line here between the Scorpio and the Sagittarius. Just barely crossing over. And across from it here, we have Venus in Taurus, our imagination, our creativity that we're trying to bring forth. And here we have this truthfulness that we want to express itself. So we get this charge from the Mars energy to really kind of help us move forward into understanding a little bit of that truthfulness. So we look at the two of them. Our imagination needs to find some truthfulness to it. Some truthfulness needs to use some imagination to understand it a little better. And so the two play off each other. You know, two ends of the same thing trying to accomplish a similar goal. It only works if both of them stay on the teeter-totter. If one of them jumps off, then there's a problem. And then 11.26 p.m. tonight... Capricorn is going to be in a sextile with Urine, uh, Neptune. says unexpected changes. We need to look at things in a different way. 
take need to need to take a new perspective not unexpected changes a new perspective okay we need to as we're looking through the water of life the water around us things can sometimes become illusionary so we need to learn to look past that again the idea of illusion just like with Capricorn is there looking past it okay so with Capricorn the thing to be aware of the most with cat the thing to be aware of the most with Capricorn is hold on one second here so we'll be having a bit of a well this is just par for the course teaching and learning the lesson of the material world okay we, everything's an illusion can't take it all at face value anyway let's move on from here moon phase 92.7 percent of the way there making its way back to the new moon where it will be June 4th the Jewish calendar today's date is 16 liar Omer count day 31 moving into day 32 daily thought for today is youthful wisdom wisdom lives in the future and from there it speaks to us there is no such thing as a wisdom of the past wisdom preceded the world and wisdom is its destiny with each passing moment wisdom becomes younger as we come closer to the time when it breaks out of its womb and breathes the air of the day our ancient mothers and fathers the sages all those from whom we learn wisdom they are not guardians of the past they are messengers of the future okay the dream spell oracle we're at the end of the wave spell now we're going to jump off as the warrior asking questions using our intelligence as we go into life okay we need to use our intelligence so as not to be deceived we need to ask questions that is how we grow that's why yellow is there because as we use our intelligence we grow we have the Sun shining over the enlightenment the light around us in the light we have the opportunity to see things that we don't see in the dark okay our, our dreams our intuition it's our like-minded energy our challenge today is understanding the world of life and death the world bridger and the hidden power we have is that life force energy that flows through us phrase for today is I endure in order to question transcending fearlessness I seal the output of intelligence with the cosmic tone of presence I am guided by the power of universal fire solar wind currently at 415.9 kilometers per second planetary K index quiet at a three probably going to say the same over the next 24 to 48 hours uh, coronal hole we have a little one opening up here probably feel some effect from that tells us 26th through the 27th M class flare possibility and X are both at 1% geomagnetic storm activity is slightly increasing going from 10 to 15 in the mid latitudes upper latitudes from 20 to 25 so a little bit of an increase there in the energies around us and finally looking up at the sky tonight the 24th Jupiter's moon Europa crosses Jupiter's face tonight from 9 24 p.m. to 12 12 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time followed by its specially tiny black shadow from 1157 to 240 a.m. Eastern Time all right so there you go that's our cosmic weather that's what we are dealing with today that brings us to UFO news what's up next This is the UFO News with Joshua Poet. All right, Dirk. Thank you very much. Today's UFO News is five stories. First story we have here, huge UFO in the sky photographed by two men 1,500 miles apart. This takes us to, uh, to this object right here. Contrast was added, make it a little easier to see there. This took place in northern Indiana. This is a great video where the eyewitness, Mr. MBB33 of YouTube, gives an excellent account of two UFO sightings that are 1,500 miles apart, but describing the same object. 
All right, here's the eyewitness report. I saw I reported this thing in the sky to you guys, and the following day a gentleman from northern Indiana saw and photographed the same object in the sky approximately 20 minutes after eyewitness. Is visual and identical to mine, a large structure traveling to the northeast, appearing to orbit to the left side of the moon at the 10 o'clock position, moving through the sky in broad daylight. Typically, space debris is not visible nor photogenic from the ground unless it is re-entering the atmosphere at mind-boggling speeds. Putting on the fireworks show, this did not, in the camera, it looked, did look like a structure, but not the ISS. Originally email from the witness of Indiana below. The reason I even took the shot was it appeared to look like a cigar-shaped object moving through the sky. Uh, and I was like, OMG, out of my several shots, this was the only photo with something in it. Thanks for responding to me. I watch every post you make from the Hydra post on. All right, there you go. So there's our sighting right there. All right, moving on to the next one. We have a black UFO moving slowly over East London. This UFO was seen in London last week as it passes in front of the cloud. The blackness of its color stands out. The UFO is turning slowly as it moves, and this is why its shape comes every few seconds. London is a hot spot of UFO activity, so this comes as no surprise. There's our object right there, almost in the middle of the picture there. Of course, when you enlarge the screen, you'll see it much better. Moving on. A man in Washington reports military helicopter escorting a UFO. A military helicopter reportedly escorted a cigar-shaped UFO near to ground level, according to witness at Battleground in Washington. The incident that happened at 11.20 p.m. on March 21st was reported to MUFON the following day and can be assessed in case 75344 from the organization's witness reporting database. The witness was in the backyard and heard a sound of an incoming flying object, presumably a Chinook helicopter nearby. It flew close to the ground as it passed into view. Ahead of it was an apparent black moving craft, according to the witness. Although the witness admitted to observing both were very short, he could make out the cigar shape of the UFO, which made no sound at all. It appeared to the witness that the helicopter flying close to it was an escort of the mysterious silent aerial thing. The witness thinks there has been UFO activity for many years in the area. He claimed that he's had prior reports from the place, so hasn't mentioned other unusual sightings in the area. He suggested that UFO watchers should visit Battleground Washington. Washington Assistant Director Alita Dabi investigated the case and closed. It is unknown. In her report, Dabi wrote that the UFO and military aircraft were about the same size, speed, and altitude. Two to three hundred feet off the ground. The known aerial object could be a Chinook helicopter as it had two props. The UFO was in front of the chopper and not the slug underneath it, but moved as fast as the aircraft without making any sound and was not lighted. The investigator concluded this was unknown, but did not rule out the fact that this could be a military vehicle not known to her at the time. Here's a picture that goes back supposedly to the Apollo 11 and this object in the sky which looks somewhat like the Millennium Falcon there it is kind of also like the image we've seen on the bottom of the Baltic it says YouTube user StreetCap1 found this image amongst JPL uh, resources the tether incident has also many similarities to the Millennium Falcon in Star Wars. So many UFOs and structures in NASA photos, and NASA still refuses to acknowledge or even investigate any of them. Many NASA scientists have said in the past that NASA tries to live by the motto, for the benefit of all. But honestly, I just don't see it. They are doing what's best for them in the U.S. military, what the public wants, and what we want them to investigate hits a deaf ears at NASA. And finally, one last piece, conspiracy theorists claim UFO prevents huge impact of a meteor to Earth. 
friendly aliens may have just saved the Earth from a destructive meteor strike, claimed conspiracy theorists. A theory surfaced after released footage showed a fireball exploding in the skies of Maine, New England, in the U.S. The natural phenomena shows an apparent second smaller object entering the atmosphere of the Earth during the incident on Tuesday. The presence of a second object was confirmed by the American Meteor Society, who said it was just a smaller meteor fragment as it broke up in Earth's atmosphere. Despite the AMS explanation, most diehard alien chasers still thought an alien craft was dispatched to destroy the meteor, which believed to prevent an impact. The further theory claimed that galactic patrols might be looking over humanity, as these space beings know that the people on Earth still don't have the technology to deal with comet strikes or asteroid, which could wipe out the entire planet. The fireball was witnessed over Canada, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, New York, Vermont, New Jersey, and New Hampshire. YouTube user channel Nemesis Maturity uploaded the video that showed two objects. One seemingly followed the other. The second seemed to strike the bigger one prior to explosion. The video is from a security camera installed at Burlington International Airport, South Burlington, Vermont. Okay, and it's a three minute, 34 second video. It's actually of still shots here, you can see. Okay. See, definitely something's going on up there. Take this, enlarge it, so you can get a better view of it. And that is our UFO news for today. So, stay tuned. I'll be back. responsible for some of the greatest crimes against this nation would you really want to know these are big questions but these questions deserve answers it's time to demand the truth
patriots arise. It's time to demand the truth. All right. Continuing on. Continuing on. So yesterday, had a good, uh, felt really good with the information. We're going to continue on with that topic of the flat earth. Like as I said, I'm thinking I'm going to make it a weekly segment. Uh, do it once a week because there's so much involved with the subject. You can't just read one thing and say, okay, I understand that's how it is. It's flat. Maybe you can, but generally it takes a good deal of study because we've been led to believe for such a long while that the earth is a ball. And, you know, as the evidence shows, that's not necessarily the case. So, very, very fascinating subject. What I want to do today is I want to expand a little bit from there, and I want to go into talking about the Bible. I want to talk about the Bible because I, I talk about it quite often. Um, I talk about the stories from the Bible. I talk about the Nag Hammadi Library and you know, oftentimes I, I made references to the Bible and some of the the uh, errors within it or inconsistencies. So I've had emails and comments, you know, from viewers, listeners, wondering about how it is that I will use the Bible as a reference while at the same time feeling that there's inconsistencies in it. So I thought this would be a good opportunity to kind of get into that discussion, explain a little bit of where I'm coming from. So first thing I'm going to start off with here is this post over at Wikipedia. The Bible from Coin Greek is a collection of texts sacred in Judaism and Christianity. It is a collection of scriptures written at different times by different authors in different locations. Jews and Christians consider the books of the Bible to be a product of divine inspiration or an authoritative record of a relationship between God and humans. The canonical Bible varies depending on traditions or groups. A number of Bible canons have evolved with overlapping and diverging contents. The Christian Old Testament overlaps with Hebrew Bible and the Greek Septuagint. The Hebrew Bible is known in Judaism as Tanakh, and the Old the New Testament is a collection of writings by early Christians believed to be Jewish disciples of Christ, written in the first century Koine Greek. These early Christian Greek writings consist of narratives, letters, and apocalyptic writings. Among Christian denominations, there is some disagreement about the contents of the canon, primarily in the Apocrypha, a list of works that are regarded as varying levels, with varying levels of respect. Attitudes towards the Bible also vary among Christian groups, Roman Catholics, Angelicans and early Orthodox Christians stressed the harmony and importance of the Bible as a sacred and sacred tradition, while Protestant churches focus on the idea of sola scripture or scripture alone. This concept arose during the Protestant Reformation, and many denominations today continue to support the use of the Bible as the only source of Christian teaching. With estimated total sales of over 5 billion copies, the Bible is widely considered to be the best-selling book of all time. It has estimated annual sales of 100 million copies and has been a major influence on literature and history, especially in the West, where the Gutenberg Bible was the first mass-printed book. Okay, uh, The English word Bible is from the Latin Biblia, from the same word in medieval Latin and Latte Latin, known as Koine Greek. Uh, medieval Latin Biblia, short for Biblia Sacra, Holy Book, while Biblia in Greek and late Latin is neutral plural, gradually became regarded as a feminine singular Biblia, Biblia in medieval Latin, and so the word was loaned as a singular in the vernaculars of Western Europe. The word itself has a literal meaning of paper or scroll and came to use as the ordinary word for book. It is the diminutive of Egyptian papyrus, possibly also called from the name of the physician seaport Biblios. Okay. Uh, textual history by the second century BCE, Jewish groups had called the Bible books the scriptures and referred to them as holy, or in Hebrew, uh, Ketave Hakodesh. 
and the Christians now commonly call the Old and New Testaments of the Christian Bible. Okay, so there's more to it here. Basically, what we have is a series of books that were all put together for a specific purpose. To tell a specific story of the religious teachers throughout time. First question, is the Bible inspired by God? The answer, yes. Was God the one who actually took and glued and put the pages of the book together? No. Humans did that. The humans who did that had political agendas. Therefore, the words that were inspired by God, by the authors, were perverted, were changed, were discarded by the men who had political agendas when they put the book together. So we have to be able to look at and decipher what is what. Remember, history is written by the winners. That's how it's been throughout time. So all of these stories where there's conquest that took place, chances are there's going to be some influence by the conquerors on the information that goes into the material that might be different than those who were conquered. The stories that we get, like the New Testament of Jesus, might not be completely accurate within the biblical um, writings because men went ahead and put those together. Men who had an agenda. Now, again, history is written by the winners. We're told that Jesus was crucified. He wasn't the one who was the winner in that regards. Okay, later the resurrection and all that happened really brought to light a different sense of understanding and faith. But the men who crucified Jesus most likely didn't say after they crucified him, now let's take everything he said, put it in book format, and put it all out for all the people to understand. They probably didn't do that. They probably wanted to strike his name from the record, strike his teachings from the record, and just ignore the fact that he was around. But that didn't happen because too many loyal followers and disciples kept the wisdom alive and this teachings had to go underground. So this is the story and the case for majority of the stories in the Bible, inspired by God, but men had political agendas and that influenced the way in which they incorporated those books. Same way today, we have all sorts of people receiving inspiration from God writings and and things that are channeled through them that people just don't look at and consider because they only want to consider this particular source and anything outside of that is disregarded why because people have gotten used to these agendas and these agendas have determined that people should only look at certain things and that's kind of silly because if we don't realize the manipulation that occurred by men, then we get led in the wrong place. We get led astray. I always like to cross-reference and look at various bits of material to see what's what. Gnostic Gospels is something that I find is very important because these teachings were teachings that were hidden and as you read through and understand why it is described they were hidden, because at that time they knew that if it wasn't the case they would be destroyed and so these teachings had to be hidden the teachings not only of the Gnostic Gospels and Nag Hammadi but the writings we find from the Essenes there's a lot of other information that paints and shows a different side of Yeshua than what we get within the Holy Bible the Bible tells one story but it was a book that was edited by men with political reasons I know I keep saying that but it's important to know because we need to decipher the difference between what's real and what isn't. So I have a number of links here of information we're going to look at. First one, BibleInfo.com. Who wrote the Bible? Answer, 40 authors wrote the Bible over a period of 1,500 years. These Bible writers wrote as they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. Moses was the first person to write portions of scripture, while John, the disciple of Jesus, was the last. Other famous people who wrote the Bible include David, Daniel, Peter, Paul, Jonah, Isaiah, 
Solomon and David. Okay. Um, those who wrote the Bible lived at a different time, sub separated by hundreds of years. In many cases, they were complete strangers to one another. Some Bible writers were businessmen or traders. Others were shepherds, fishermen, soldiers, physicians, preachers, kings, human beings from all walks of life. They served under different governments and lived within contrasting cultures and systems of philosophy. But here is the wonder of it all. When the 66 books of the Bible with their 1,189 chapters made up of 31,173,000 verses are brought together, King James Version, we find perfect harmony in the messages they convey. As the great scholar F.F. F. Bruce noted, the Bible is not simply an ethology. There is a unity which binds the whole thing together. The Bible writers gave God's message by voice and pen while they lived, and when they died, their writings live after them. These prophetic messages were then gathered together under God's leading in the book we called the Bible. Who wrote the Bible, God or man? The scripture says in 2 Peter 1, 20, 21, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit revealed to the prophets the message of scripture. The writers of the Bible wrote not according to their own will or whim, but only as they were moved or controlled by the Spirit of God. The Bible is God's own book. 2 Timothy 5, 3, 16 through 17, all scripture is God breathed in and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped with every good work. The Holy Bible affects human beings so profoundly because all the Bible is God breathed. It is more than a collection of moral principles. It is more than a great book. It is an inspired document. God's book, the prophets who wrote the Bible, related what they saw and heard in human languages, but their message came directly from God. Okay? Very important what they say. Their messages came from God. But it was not these authors who finally put the book together. They simply put down the messages that they were receiving. So their messages were inspired by God. But later, men, men who were rebelling against God, men who were connected to those who crucified Jesus, were the ones who took these books and decided what should stay and what shouldn't stay. And in many cases, it was just picking and choosing because they didn't know any other way to do it. And so it was eeny, meeny, miny, mo. We'll go with this book here. We'll go with this one here. And there were editings and things that occurred which make it challenging because we need to look past what men wrote to find what God wrote. And that's why there is consistency because God did inspire this book. So you find that consistency. But you also find the errors that men did and you can go through the Bible, and if you know where to look, you can find many places in there where you see these errors, where you see the human hand that was affecting things. Happens nowadays in this world. Why wouldn't it happen back then? And then, of course, we have a list of all the authors within the Bible. And here's a really nice little infographic here that uh, gives us a little history timeline of the Bible when it was written, and who wrote all the books of the Bible, Moses, other disciples, John, Paul, okay, all right, here we have another site, uh, why you can believe the Bible, the Bible was written over a span of 1500 years by 40 writers, unlike other religious writings, the Bible reads as a factual news account of real events, places, and people, and dialogue. Historians and archaeologists have repeatedly confirmed its authenticity. Using the writer's own writing styles and personalities, God showed us who he is and what it is like to know him. There is one central message consistently carried by all 40 writers of the Bible. God who created us desired a relationship with us. He calls us to know him and to trust him. 
The Bible not only inspires us, it explains life and God to us. It does not answer all of the questions we might have, but enough of them. It shows us how to live with purpose and compassion, how to relate to others. It encourages us to rely on God for strength, direction, and enjoy His love for us. The Bible also tells us that we can have eternal life. Multiple categories of evidence support the historical accuracy of the Bible, as well as its claim to divine authorship. Here is, are the subsections of this article. Okay, so about archaeology, how does archaeology support the Bible? Has the Bible changed over time, or do we have what was originally written? Are the gospel accounts of Jesus reliable? Did historians confirm what the Bible says about Jesus? Are there contradictions in the Bible? How were the books of the New Testament determined? Why not the Gospel of Judas? Why did it take 30 to 60 years for the Gospels to be written? Does it matter if Jesus really did say and what the Bible says he said? So, I'm just going to leave this for you here. And within all of these, there has been archaeological support. There has been you know, changes, all of these things we can look at, we've answered, I've been talking about them, but I'm going to continue on. Okay, so we have this book, the Bible, we have men that were inspired to write, put this book together, and then we had men who came together to edit this book, and they had an agenda. What were they going to put out to the people? What kind of information? Now, because the words were inspired by God, they couldn't get rid of those words. Kind of reminds me how the story of Yaldabaoth and Yaldabaoth claimed to be God and wanted to trap God in a skin suit. So the skin suit was made. And the skin suit is kind of like the words, the book itself, the skin suit. Well, the skin suit has no life unless God breathes life into it. So God breathed life into humankind and that allowed humanity to rise. It, this creature, which was just an unanimated being, suddenly came to life, animated with life when the Spirit breathed into it. The words of the Bible, same way. Even though men wrote it, even though it has its limitations because men wrote it and, and edited it, it still is breathed and inspired by this Word of God, which is why we see so much truth within it. Now when we look at the words of the various prophets and teachers, Jesus, um, we're told over and over, seek and find. That we need to seek to find. Well, you don't seek for something that is out in the open because you see it right there. You seek for things that are hidden. Over and over, we're told by Jesus, Yeshua, that we need to seek for something that is hidden, and we should not be deceived. So, therein lies two clues, that if we just take something at face value, we might not really see what's there, because we need to seek further into that information. And as we seek further, we find that there is more information available, some of which was left out. This is why I like to go to the Gnostic Gospels, because you find stories in there which are similar stories that are told in the New Testament, but there's more to it. It's as if somebody took the stories that are in the Nag Hammadi Gospels, took portions of it, included those stories, and then left the rest out. But in reading through the Gnostic Gospels, you get the whole picture. And what I find fascinating is throughout the entire time of Jesus' ministry, you don't hear Jesus refer to God by anything other than Father, Abba, Mother. And when you read into the Gnostic Gospels, that is what he is referring to them all the time, the All-Parent, Mother, Father, God. He doesn't give him a specific name like Yahweh. Okay, that is something that is left behind in the Old Testament. Because in the Old Testament, as we read, we find that there are various versions or aspects to God. We're told that God has many faces, and that's what this is. These are just the same being, just many different faces. 
or it could be different beings that were all working together. The word Elohim itself seems to indicate that there is more than one, a group of them. So we have the story of Yaldabaoth that the Gnostic Gospels tell us is a fallen being who is then the same being that is in the Garden of Eden creating humankind. And we see that story in the Bible and we think, well, this is great. God created humankind and we go on from there. But when we read the Gnostic Gospels and you have Jesus telling us that this same being who created in the garden is the same being and that is the fallen one, it starts to get a little bit cloudy because you want to look at the information and say, well, okay, I understand what is being said here, but this is a bit contradictory to what is being told in this book. Why is that the case? Is this information in the Gnostic Gospels attempting to deceive me? Or is this the truth that was hidden and this book here was attempting to deceive me? Because remember, it was all written by men put together by men, inspired by God, but put together by men. But you have such different stories between the Gnostic Gospels, the origin of the world, the Apocalypse of Adam, the Apocryphon of John, such stories that are different from the stories you have in the New Testament, the stories in the Old Testament on creation. There's a continuity with the Gnostic Gospels about Yaldabaoth and the Archons that were created that bring us an understanding of these influences that are trying to subvert humankind you don't get that when you read through the biblical story you just kind of see this idea that there's darkness out there we just call him the devil and that's it but it gets into much further explanation so I think that's important I think that we have to look at the Bible and and we have to try to see what is there for us to understand that is inspired and what was written by man I think for the most part, uh, the Bible's intact and is truly inspired, but there are places. You know, if when you look in the New Testament, we can see that there's a timeline that the Old Testament lays out of when Yeshua was born. We could see that. He was born six months after John the Baptist. John the Baptist was born around Passover. Six months after that takes us to September. We know from the timeline that Yeshua was born at a different date than December 25th. Yet, the New Testament continues to tell us this date of December 25th, but that date doesn't match up with anything that we understand would be happening in the world at that time. So, there seems to be some understanding that what is in there is not completely accurate. Someone twisted it around for a particular reason. When you realize how many beings there are, sun gods, that were born on December 25th, were later crucified, died, or were killed, and then rose up from the dead, you'd be quite amazed because there's not just one, two, three, there's you know dozens of these beings. So it's a storyline that has played out over and over. When we go to Genesis and the story of creation, this whole biblical story of creation seems to mirror the story in the Babylonian mythology that took place. So there was information borrowed from there. We have the stories of the uh, Sumerians and the Anunnaki, which occurred long, long before the Bible was written. You know, thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And then along came the Bible, and so it's like, well, where does this fit into it? If the world was here for thousands of years prior to this, and then all of a sudden Sumer popped up, and the Sumerians and what we know of as the stories in the Old Testament started to come to life, where, where does this fit into the big picture? Who is Yahweh in the big picture if he is right here? when the whole world was created. So was he to do this? Or you know what I'm saying? There's some discrepancies. And so I think that we really need to use a discerning eye to look and see. I do believe the book is inspired, as I keep saying, but I believe and I understand that men edited it. So I'm going to look closely at what it is that I'm looking at to try to 
determine what is what. Here's another one. Uh, did the Holy Spirit inspire the Bible's authors to write without errors? It says, with regard to the Bible, inspiration donates the doctrine that the human authors and editors of canon scripture were letter influenced by deity, with the result that their writings may be designated in some sense the Word of God. Historically, Christians have generally believed that the entire Bible to be inerrant, free of error, in the book's original autograph versions. However, the entire Bible was written by a group of very human authors. The only way in which fallible humans could have written so much inerrant text would have been for them to have been inspired by God. Given biblical inerrancy, one can assume that God must have overseen the creation of the Bible's text in some way and proactively prevented the authors from committing any error. Fundamentalist and other evangelical Christians still follow the traditional belief. Literal Christians have generally abandoned the belief in both inerrancy and inspiration of the Bible. Instead, they analyze the Bible as a historical document using techniques of higher criticism. Okay, and so we have a couple examples here. This here is different types of ways in which people were inspired. It says various Christian groups of different beliefs concerning the mechanism by which inspiration took place. I've certainly heard of a number of these uh, automatic writing. The Oxford Companion to the Bible states that Philo of Alexandria proposed what might be termed the mantic theory of inspiration of the scriptures in which the human author becomes possessed by God and loses consciousness of self, surrendering to the divine spirit and his communicatory powers. Uh, the dictation theory, this is the belief the Holy Spirit predetermined each word that the authors wrote. The authors were thus performing the function of a secretary. Negative assistance, uh, Jean Jacques Bonfrey suggests that the authors expressed their thoughts in their own style and words, while the Holy Spirit only intervened as needed in order to prevent them from making any mistakes. In other theories, uh, the Holy Spirit provided precise ideas, thoughts, and concepts to the authors, who then wrote them down in their own words. The authors were inspired by the Holy Spirit so that the normal powers of observation and writing were heightened. They were thus able to describe their religious thoughts with greater accuracy. And finally, that God did not directly inspire the writers of the Bible. The texts are not errant, but were written by authors with a high degree of religious insight. Okay, They were inspired by the same way great artists and musicians have been considered inspired. So a variety of different ways to look at some of what's going on out there. Um, here are a couple of pieces. Very interesting. They get into talking about all of the, as you scroll down, you can get into all of the writers of the Bible, who they are, what they were about. Okay, so I wanted to bring this link up so you can go and read through these. Uh, Here's another one. Who wrote the Bible? 35 authors who wrote the Bible. If you ever asked your pastor on Sunday or a Sunday school teacher who wrote the Bible, you probably get one or two responses. God wrote the Bible. The Holy Spirit moved prophets like Moses and apostles like Paul to write about God's relationship with the world. About 40 people wrote the Bible. The individual books are written by many authors over many years in many places to many different groups of people. Both are true, but by now you're probably looking at a little more detail about the authors of the Bible, and rightly so, when you're studying a book or passage of the Bible, it's pretty important to know who wrote it. So let's take a closer look at who wrote. Before we jump into the list of names, let me throw out a few disclaimers. This is a list of authors of biblical Bible identities. I've also thrown in a few traditional candidates. There are more authors of the Bible than the 35 I've listed. Okay, so if we go through... We've got the Moses being the author of the five books, first five books, and you've got the uh, author of the next group. You can go through same names that we've been seeing. Okay, all men inspired by God over time. And then we have this, the first council of Nicaea. This is where things changed. 
The first Council of Nicaea was a council of Christian bishops convened in Nicaea in Bithynia by the Roman Emperor Constantine, 325 A.D. This first economical council was the first effort to attain consensus in the church through an assembly representing all of Christendom. Although previous councils include the first church council, the council of Jerusalem had met before to settle matters of dispute. It was presided over by Hosius of Corduba. Its main accomplishments were the settlement of the Christological issue of the nature of the Son of God and the relationship to God the Father, the construction of the first part of the Creed of Nicaea, establishing uniform observance of the date of Easter and the promulgation of early canon law. The First Council was the first economical council of the Church. Most significantly, it resulted in the first uniform Christian doctrine called the Nicaean Creed. With the creation of the Creed, a precedent was established for subsequent local and regional councils of bishops to create statements of beliefs and canons of doctrinal ortho orthodoxy, the intent being to define unity of belief for the whole Christendom. Okay, and uh, it says the first was convened by Emperor Constantine the Great upon the recommendations of a synod led by Hosius of Cordoba in the Easter tide of 325. Constantine had invited all 1,800 bishops of the Christian Church, but a smaller unknown number attended. It says they counted uh, Estubius of Caesarea, counted more than 250. Here we have another count of 318, 270. So we're looking like around in the 300s. Okay, so. And then you can look at all the various controversies and so on and so forth. So basically you got a group of 300 folks, 300 men, and they're going to agree upon which books are going to go into the Bible. They had their political agendas. You tell me you get 300 men together these days to try to agree upon something. They're not going to agree upon what to put in there. What's going to be determined is by who is the ruling power at that time. Imagine right now if there was a book being put together, despite all the inspired readings, imagine if Obama was going to take and put that book together. What would he put out? Would he put out the absolute truth, or would he put out something that was leaning towards his agenda? He'd be putting something leaning towards his agenda, of course. That's what they all do. That's why we have to seek and find. That's why I believe that these stories that we've gotten from the Gnostic Gospels are so important because we find stories that help us to understand something a little bit deeper. If the truth of the Garden of Eden is that the being that was there is a fallen being, not an evil being, but a fallen being, one who was arrogant, one who wanted to trap God, if that is the case, then we've all been deceived from the very beginning. And if we continue to move along not understanding that, then how much more are we being deceived? If we understand that there's a bigger picture at hand and that the beings and the agenda was not meant to move us on the path of liberation, but off of the path, then you know we would read and be a little bit more discerning. So, yes, I do believe that there is inspiration of God within the Bible. Yes, I do reference this as one of the most important books that we have. But yes, I also understand that men with political agendas tampered with this book. They put some things in it for an agenda, and they took things out of it for an agenda. And some of the real teachings that we have have come to us because they have been hidden by those who knew that if they didn't hide this, the information would be destroyed because they were aware of the political agendas of the time. Political agendas have been going on for a long while. One of the things we can understand as we read through the Old Testament is the various accounts of these political agendas. Even now, the Catholic Church, the, the Vatican, has such control over things that they have an agenda. 
and we see the agenda and we see and hear the words coming out of there and we can understand that sometimes things aren't quite right that the things being said seem to be contradictory to what we might understand things that Jesus had said so we need to really use a sense of discernment we need to understand the importance of this book but we need to seek to find the answers we need to dig in to find out what's real we can't rely only upon the physical because if we do this is what happens we get caught up in the illusion we have to look deeper and there we find the truthfulness there we find the real answers we need to find so that's my take on the Bible we need to understand it as an important book there are many 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 truths within this book but there is also edits by men sometimes intentionally to change and pervert the words that were in there that is why we have to look at the book as a whole because then we see the whole message coming through and we're able to then discern the words of men from the inspirations of God and as we find these things and we start to look at it we understand because over time there's been a battle the battle has been to remove God and to replace God with science and men have agendas so that's it that's my take if you have any thoughts questions on it let me know send me an email in the meantime here is our channeled message for today this comes from Yeshua illumination and inspiration from Yeshua on freedom tilde channeled by Franz Apeta tilde May 22nd 16 dear ones I wish to speak to you today of freedom. I begin by saying that it is helpful to orient oneself to the perspective of seeing one's life as having the freedom to do or be, as opposed to freedom from something. With this focus you are free to move beyond and clear old patterns with the intention to move forward into the light and your new life without dwelling on the past, which is just your learning ground. And with moving forward and embracing and inhabiting what you have learned, you are free to catapult to wider expansive realities, which is your true birthright. Freedom is the allowance and acceptance of the expansion to one's true being, to discover the infinite possibilities. It is to extend oneself beyond limitations. It is the opening of the doors that are just waiting to be opened, what you are being encouraged to open by your higher self. It is the ultimate sacrifice of, and letting go of, one's limiting boundaries, self-imposed as they are. Be that as it may, you are gathering <coughs> and building your wings to deliver yourself to your full divine self, and sometimes it takes seeing where you are restricted in order to choose to let something go, to open yourself to wider vistas. Remember that you always have this choice to move beyond where you are restricting yourself, and it is always inherent within you the means to do so, thus delivering yourself to freedom. Do you choose to hold yourself back, or do you choose to open yourself to the fresh air of possibilities, to soar along the current of the unknown, and explore what is there, completely free of trepidation and fear? What is holding you back, dear ones? Allow your higher self to commune with you and show you the way to ultimate freedom by illuminating what is keeping you in a limited view of your abilities and thus limiting your contribution to this beautiful world we are all creating. Take another step toward freedom today, dear ones, by letting go of at least one thing that keeps you from seeing yourself as the divine being that you are, and with each day, another letting go, and with each step, you are catapulted into your own true and exquisite freedom. Additionally, take another step toward freedom today by doing something differently. Welcome in a new perspective and approach or orientation and focus, and free yourself from habit and old patterns that restrict your true exquisite freedom. You can do this each day with a different perspective or approach to something that held you captive in the past. And so I offer you this day this illumination and inspiration on freedom, so that you may see a new perspective of your own reality, 
and move closer to being the true powerful expansive divine being that you are. And you are magnificent, dear ones, in all that you are. Allow that to be, and open up to your expansiveness and freedom to be all that you are, divine and pure and free in all your glory. Nothing is holding you back but you. I love you with all that I am. Your loving brother, Yeshua. All right, very good message there from Yeshua. You know, one thing I do want to add and say is spirituality is very important to me. Sharing information is important. But one thing that I, I really think is something to avoid is misinforming people. And I've spent many a times and many hours in prayer and meditation and study because I don't want to be leading anyone down the wrong path, least of all myself. I want to understand the concept of God. I want to keep learning and growing because I believe that this is a concept bigger and bigger than we could ever possibly imagine. And when we think we've learned about that, then there's even more to learn. So, over the course of the time in studying these subjects, studying the Nag Hammadi, studying the Flat Earth, studying these very subjects that seem in some ways contradictory to what we are learning and what we are told in life, I find that my relationship with God has gotten stronger. It's not gotten weaker, it's gotten stronger. Because I understand through under the stories of Yaldabaoth and the words of the Gnostic Gospels that there is something out there bigger than what we've been told. And that if the being in the Garden of Eden wasn't the be-all, end-all God, then who is this be-all, end-all God? Where is that being? Where is that source? I take my cues from Jesus. You know, that's that's number one in my book. And I take my cues from what he says about not being deceived, about seeking to find, about understanding that there's a bigger picture out there that we need to learn from. And I believe wholeheartedly that way that, that we're trapped in a system here that we can only get out of by understanding the way out. And the way out was shown to us when Jesus came and, and showed us how we connect in with the Father, how we understand that there's something bigger going on, how there is deception around us, and we can either get caught up in it or not. The physical world is a world that is filled with many deceptions. There's also many wonderful things here. It's a world of duality that manifests itself and plays itself out. So we need to be aware as we're moving through the world. We can't be naive. We have to be aware of what's out there so that we can make positive changes to this. There's a purpose for us being here. And the more that we learn and understand, the more we understand our purpose. And it becomes even you know, more understood the more we understand. It's kind of one of those cycles that keeps going and going and going, self-perpetuating. So that's my take on it. You know, I, I take all of this very seriously. I certainly don't want to mislead anybody, and if somebody's offended because some of these subjects, I don't mean to offend anybody. I simply am continuing to seek and learn, and what I have discovered along this path is that there's more than what I've been aware of. And the way I discovered it was because I've been standing on the shoulders of those who have gone before me to present this information. I'm just, you know somebody along the path learning as I go from those who have learned as well and we share this information and we keep going so that's my whole take on this and the Bible if you have any questions let me know what you think there's plenty of ways you can reach me we can uh, discuss it further close our eyes let's do our meditation for today take a deep breath and exhale Take another deep breath, exhale again, another breath, and feel this breath moving through your body, 
exhale, back and forth, like waves in the ocean. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Mother, source of all life itself, thank you for the blessings this day. Thank you for the opportunity to open our eyes and see that which is beyond our sight. Thank you for opening our ears that we might hear what is truly being expressed. We pray that we are able to be strong and courageous as we learn truths about life, that we're able to move past any judgments as we recognize moments where we have been deceived and simply understand them as opportunities to get back on the right path. We pray this day that all the blessings of life and love and prosperity be sent back tenfold to you. And we are grateful for the energy of the Christ that flows through all of life, available to each and every one, simply by connecting, calling forth that which already shines within us. So let our subconscious mind make this journey through life today, observing what's going on. Looking at the physical world, let's see this physical world for what it is. But then let's imagine ourselves seeing past the physical to that which makes up the physical so we could understand what is real and what is not. What is an illusion and what is the truth. And as we continue to seek, we shall find. And the answer shall be made clear. So let's imagine ourselves chained with these chains of ignorance. And let's imagine this inspiration of God falling upon us like rain. And as we feel this inspiration of Spirit, flowing through us, these chains of illusion fall off and we find ourselves freed up and with this sense of freedom we're able to understand even more the moments where we are being led down the path of truth versus the moments of deception. And so let the subconscious mind continue on this journey of observing the world, seeing it for what it is and what it isn't, seeing what is behind the scenes, and connecting to the source of all. Let the subconscious mind continue on that journey, and let's bring the conscious mind back to the present moment on the count of three. Three coming back to the present moment filled with confidence. Two coming back to the present moment filled with faith, and one coming back to the present moment, happy, healthy, and whole, happy, healthy, and whole. Take another deep breath, exhale, and open your eyes. All right, my friends, that is it for today. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, it's a big subject today, the Bible. Lots of information that's out there available about it. Check out the links for today. Do some search and you'll find more links. If you find something interesting, let me know. We just have to keep seeking. You know, we have to look past the illusion. Remember, fire, water, air, and earth. We're in the earthly realm. Things operate here differently than the other realms. Things are more dense. We experience duality. But we need to look past this to realize that this world is a creation of the fire, the water, the air, the ideas, the emotions, and the words and actions. And when we understand that, it helps us to have a better understanding of what is real in this world and what is the illusion. And once we understand that difference, it's a game changer because then we can move through life with a sense of faith and strength that 
helps us to move through all of the challenges. All right? All right. That's it for today, my friends. Have an awesome day. I love you. Keep loving each other, and I'll talk to you soon. Peace. I'm out of here.